Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys uh, this morning, and it's wonderful to be in God's presence once again uh, as a family, as as a people of God. And uh, I always look forward to Sunday. I don't know about you, and uh, it's it's something really special about um, coming together and and being in God's presence. And it's something that you know, as believers, uh, only we can express to each other to know what it's like to be in God's presence. Uh, so, so really thankful to God once again for this uh, for this morning and for the privilege of knowing Him uh, alongside uh, you all. So let's look to God's Word today, and I want to talk about a, a, a very real issue that all of us uh, face. Even if you are a Christian and if you've been a Christian for a long time, uh, there is an issue of life which I want to talk about, and uh, it is the issue of anxiety. It is the issue of anxiety. So can we turn our uh, Bibles to Philippians chapter four? And read a verse which we've all heard way too many times, but we still need to hear again. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. So let me read that verse uh, for you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Next verse, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I'm reading this from the uh, NLT version, which says, do not be anxious about uh, anything. And some translations will say, be anxious for nothing. It's like the verse is saying, there is only one thing you should be anxious about, and that's nothing. And there's only one thing you should pray about, and that's everything. And this is Paul who is writing this, right? And Paul says, don't be anxious. Thank God for that. Are you not glad that it's not God's will ever for you to be anxious? It's not God's will for you to ever be crippled by anxiety. So God says you don't have to be overwhelmed and crippled by anxiety. Now watch this. The same writer who said, do not be anxious, be anxious for nothing, the same writer also said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 28. If you can turn the same book, Philippians chapter 2, verse 28. Verse 28, Paul. He says, Therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Paul is speaking about a a specific situation here. And, uh, and he says, I'm so eager to send him to you, you know, to the church. And when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Uh, some translations will say so that I may have, uh, uh, I may be less anxious. Uh, some translations might say I may have less sorrow or, uh, or worry. But you see that the same person who said, don't be anxious for anything also said, you know, let's do this so that I will have less anxiety. I think the Bible gives us a very um, realistic expectation of anxiety in life. As Christians, I don't think, to be very straightforward with you, as Christians, I don't think we can ever eliminate anxiety completely from our lives. But that's not, that's not to discourage us. I think as human beings, God has uh, wired us in such a way that anxiety is, you know, uh, is, is a normal response uh, to a situation that could be threatening. In fact, uh, not having anxiety uh, can sometimes not work you know, the best for you. So as Christians, we cannot expect that anxiety will be completely gone out of your life. But what we can expect as Christians is that we have less anxiety, that we don't have anxiety that is crippling us, that is paralyzing us, that is stopping us in our tracks, and, 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 and we... Uh, we can ask God and we can expect God to help us have very less anxiety, uh, you know, in our day-to-day life. So we've all faced anxiety. I mean, it's, anxiety is no stranger to us. We all know what it's like to feel, you know, anxious. And, and all of us, uh, you know, will face some, some kind of anxiety, whether in the present or in the future. If you're not anxious about anything now, just wait for a few days. Something might come up and make you feel anxious. But anxiety is really a part of our life, if you think about it, let's be honest. Anxiety is, is a part of our reality of life. That's just how it is. I mean, in fact, without anxiety, 
it will be very dangerous you know uh, for example you know if, if you're crossing the road and suddenly you see a you know heavy truck that's coming towards you which you did not see earlier it's it's that fear and it's that sudden boost of of uh, uh, adrenaline that causes you that that sends signals to your brain and and hopefully you don't freeze but you flee you know but it god has wired us in such a way that we should be uh, um, responding you know with with more uh, uh urgency when it comes to situations that are threatening to us so that's normal but the question is how do we have less anxiety anxiety that's not crippling us that's not paralyzing uh us in our day to day life now some people feel anxious for everything for everything that's a problem right the kind of people who feel anxious when there's nothing to be anxious about you know like people who say you know i i'm i'm anxious and uh, i don't know what i'm anxious about there's nothing for me to feel anxious about and that makes me feel anxious I I know a person who is working for a boss you know who is known as uh, who is known to be a very highly anxious person and uh, for example if he has to catch a flight he is at the airport way too early unreasonably early way too early it's like what are you going to do you know for 22 hours at the airport before the flight way too early like someone said i have so much anxiety that even my anxiety has anxiety okay and sometimes you know anxiety can even leave a lasting impression uh it can change the way you uh do things uh even even mundane things that we do in life uh, i remember one incident that happened to me uh many months ago uh i was on my way to you know a, a shop to buy things for the house and uh, i went to the parking lot and i put my scooter key uh, in the keyhole and i was ready to, t- uh, to take my scooter out but just before that i wanted to open the the seat of my scooter to pick something up from the compartment and as i you know pulled the seat up and, I, and as i looked into the compartment there was this frog that was sitting right in the compartment of my scooter i mean i was not expecting a frog i was expecting to see my uh, you know my my things which i regularly keep in the compartment but to see a frog all of a sudden in a place where you least expect is is really uh, you know it, it's it's going to make you freeze and that's what happened to me i just froze i just froze when i saw that frog and it was a brown frog and uh, it was a brown frog and uh i don't know if i offended the fo- uh, you know frog uh, i don't know if i hurt his feelings but but he was facing me like he was he was facing me he was like looking you know like at me like uh, as if i should have knocked you know before opening as if i as if i invaded his you know his privacy as as if i invaded his space but i don't know if i hurt his feelings i don't know if i uh, offended this frog but the next second true story the next second this frog leapt this frog jumped and guess where it landed right on my stomach <laughs> it landed right on my stomach it was right here this frog like you've seen people do pull ups in the gym right you've seen people do pull ups but sometimes when people do pull ups they'll do a pull up and they'll hang there that's exactly what the frog looked like it was hanging on to my my shirt and and i could just literally see a frog right on my stomach and it's it's almost like doing a pull up and that made me freeze even more even more and uh, you know sometimes like you want to say something like you know you want the voice to come out but it doesn't come out you know it's just stuck there and that's exactly uh you know how it was for me uh but thankfully as i froze you know uh, the the um, next second the frog again took another jump and this time it landed on the you know on on the ground and uh, uh never saw him again never saw him again but i expect to see him every time i take the scooter every time i take the scooter when i when i open the compartment i i, I always want to do it slowly to make sure the frog's not there you see that one incident you know it it leaves a lasting impression that uh you know it's it's it, it reminds you of uh, of something that happened which you don't want to you know see happen again but over time i've i've uh, outgrown that now i freely take my uh, scooter so don't imagine me always pulling my scooter out with anxiety but you can see that anxiety can sometimes leave a lasting impression too uh but the good news ultimately is that god wants us to know how to deal with anxiety god has told us about anxiety in his word god knows anxiety is a part of life and he has told us how to deal with it so that we can control anxiety and not let anxiety control us someone said that in the bible it says do not be afraid 366 times 366 times do not be afraid god you know says or or rather it says in the bible do not be afraid 366 times that's like god is that's like god saying don't be afraid every day of the year including the leap year do not be afraid 366 times if you don't believe me go home and count 
go home and count. You can, uh, you know, feel free to do that, but make sure you don't get anxious about that too. But God here, uh, you know, has said in his Bible, uh, you know, in the word that we are not to be afraid. We are not to be anxious. And, and so he has spoken about how to deal with anxiety. So, so let me start by telling you what is anxiety? What is anxiety? You see, anxiety is just like fear. But there is a small difference between fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety are like cousins. Fear is when you face a real threat, a real threat. But anxiety is when you face an imagined threat. Fear is when you face a threat that is true in actuality. But anxiety is when you imagine a threat and you suffer as a result of it. For example, if you have to go for a job interview, you imagine all kinds of scenarios where you know it's going downhill and you have uh, you know no words to say you might you 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 are afraid that you will stutter and you will go blank and so these are all in our imaginations and that causes you anxiety so anxiety is often broadly speaking it is defined as facing an imaginary threat a uh, potential threat we could say and because of anxiety we suffer more in our imaginary world than in the real world. We suffer more in the imaginary world than in the real world. And I can give you an example directly from the Bible that explicitly talks about this experience. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Verse 7. We read here about Jacob's experience with anxiety. Genesis chapter 32 verse 7. About Jacob it says, In great fear and distress. Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group and the group that is left may escape. And then in verse 9, Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. This passage here that we you know, read speaks about Jacob, and Jacob's problem with an imaginary threat. But his imaginary threat is well grounded because he is anxious about meeting his brother. Because if you know the story, he stole from his brother. He stole, uh, you know, the birthright from, from his brother Esau. And, uh, and his brother has been really angry with him. And, you know, his brother uh, you know, has wanted to even kill him. Uh, we read that in the Bible. But, in, but this is after a long time. And Jacob is, knows that he's going to meet his brother. And what is Jacob imagining? Jacob is imagining that as soon as he meets Esau, Esau is going to strike him dead. Esau is going to kill him. That is what is going on in his mind. And so in great fear, uh, in great fear and distress, it says, Jacob came up with a strategy. He divided into two groups, let, you know, the first group go ahead. Uh, if they die, at least we can escape. So you see all this, uh, this planning and, and trying to cope up with this, with this anxious uh, feeling that is overwhelming him is very clear in Jacob's life. And out of this anxiety, he prays and says, Oh God of my you know, father, Abraham, please save me. Please rescue me. And even, you know, tries to say, God, you know, I've been, uh, I am unworthy of, of your kindness and, and faithfulness. He's humbling himself before God. But what happens in the story? Genesis chapter 33, verse 4, it says, But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? He asked, and they continued the conversation. What happened in the story though? When Esau saw Jacob, he embraced him, he hugged him, he missed him. You know, he, he said, brother, I, I missed you. And he went and uh, embraced him and, and threw his arms around his neck. Totally different from what Jacob had imagined in his mind. All that anxiety and, and the fear that, that he experienced was a result of his imagination. Because he imagined Esau as a threat but in actuality, Esau was going to embrace him. Now, what if, what if he knew that Esau was simply going to embrace him? What if he knew in advance that Esau is simply going to come and give him a hug 
and, and welcome him back. What if he knew that? Would he be anxious? He would not be anxious. Why? That shows us that anxiety often takes place in our imaginations. And uh, I don't know if, if you can say for sure, but I think you can look back in your life and think of many uh, anxious situations that you went through. But then when you saw the outcome, you realized, okay, I, I didn't really have anything to be anxious about because, you know, what I imagined was far worse, but what happened was, was no big deal. In fact, it was uh, much better than what I had expected. That is often our, our experience. Anxiety happens in our imaginary world. And so I think God wants us to uh, have a control over our imaginations, to not imagine, uh, to not exaggerate the threats that, that we might face because that causes anxiety. And so it helps to understand that a lot of anxiety is in the imagination and to not let our minds go wild with imagination uh, of threats that we might face. And so that helps with anxiety too. I believe there are three sources, broadly speaking, three sources of anxiety. Three sources. The first source I want to mention is the spiritual source. When anxiety comes to you from a spiritual source, or to put it another way, anxiety that comes to you from a demonic source, from a demonic source. Ephesians uh, 6.12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. In 2 Corinthians 10.3.5, it says, we live in the world, but we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, but we have divine power to demolish strongholds, strongholds in the mind. You know, sometimes when you have anxiety and you cannot tell why you have anxiety, it could be that the anxiety is coming from a, it's coming from a spiritual uh, source. It's coming from a demonic uh, source. And the truth is, no amount of medical help is going to fix that anxiety. If the anxiety is from a spiritual source, you know, from a demonic source, no amount of medical help is going to help the person. So what is the solution? You know, the solution is very simple if the source is spiritual, if the source is demonic. It's very simple. All the person has to do is ask Jesus to take over. That's all the person has to do. All the person has to do is, is offer himself or herself to Jesus and invite Jesus into his life or her life and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to take over. And when Jesus takes over, every demonic spirit has to vacate. Every evil spirit has to vacate. The solution is actually simple. Asking Jesus to take over. If the person is willing to have Jesus take over, the solution is simple. But medical help does not fix anxiety. That's why you know, I, I think there are many cases... Uh, in the medical field, when patients are, you know, tre uh, treated with anxiety, but still there is not a, you know, a, a, a lasting solution that has come about because medical help is insufficient, and uh, it's not going to work if the source is demonic. But the solution is simple, as I said. The second source is biological source. Biological source. This is when anxiety is not coming from a spiritual source, but it's coming from your own body. It's coming from the chemical imbalances in your brain. It is coming because your bodily functions are, are not working as it should. And so it is simply coming because of your biology. It is not spiritual, but it comes because of your biology. And, and some say that even physical uh, inactiveness, you know, is linked to anxiety. So even our biology has, uh, you know, an impression, uh, uh, has an effect on the mind and it can cause anxiety. So the right thing to do, the right thing to do in this case is to get medical help, is to take the medicines, you know, prescribed by the doctor, uh, uh, take the medicines that will relieve this anxiety, that will uh, bring these chemical imbalances to balance, and, and that should be the source of, of help. Now, I remember speaking to a Christian psychologist um, recently, a, a few, few weeks back, I think, and, uh, and uh, she was talking about how, you know, many churches have made a bad mistake by treating anxiety only as a spiritual problem. And, and she said that, you know, in so many churches, you know, people, uh, you know, have not been able to come out of anxiety because the church has only taught anxiety as a spiritual problem. And, and she said, we need to recognize that, that uh, anxiety can also be caused because of biology. And just like how we might take a tablet you know, to, to deal with, you know, a headache or uh, to, to deal with, you know, something else that goes wrong in the body. It is just as fine to take medical help for anxiety in cases where anxiety is chronic, in cases where anxiety is very acute. 
So this psychologist made a valid point that many churches say it's all spiritual. And so they mismanage many people and, and I think many people suffer as a result of that. Whereas on the other hand, the secular field would say it's all biological. They don't talk about the spiritual. But as Christians, God says we need to understand, we need to have a wholesome understanding of this matter. So that's the second source. It is the biological uh, source. And we need to also know that God approves taking medicines. And God has showed it in the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul gives a medical instruction to Timothy. He says, Timothy, stop drinking only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. He says, don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. So here is Paul asking Timothy in the Bible, as we read it, to take medicine, to deal with an illness, which is a clear mark of God approving the use of medicines because even medicines are ultimately because of the common grace of God. So taking medicines is not separation from taking God's help because medicine is also a means by which God offers help to us. So Paul is using wine here for its medicinal uh, value. And that's why he tells Timothy to take a little bit of uh, wine because that acts as a medicine for your sickness. So the second source you know, can tell us that medical help is the solution. But let me also say that medical help is, is only half the solution. It's only half the solution. Even if the source is biological, the medical help that you can receive is only half a solution. I think the other half is spiritual intimacy with God. The person who has anxiety because of you know, um, biological reasons also needs God. God can never be removed out of the equation. The person also needs intimacy with God, fellowship with God, and receive God's peace. And that's what brings full relief. The third source I want to mention is the natural source. That's the source that most of us you know, deal with, the uh, natural source of anxiety, or I can say um, situational anxiety or, or circumstantial anxiety. Anxiety that comes as a result of your situation or your circumstance or a threat that you're facing in your situation. It could be concerning your future, it could be concerning your job interview, it could be a problem at work, it could be your exams, uh, a crisis, it could be a health checkup, it could be a doctor's report, it could be your loved ones who have not come home uh, and, and it's getting really late and, and you can't reach them on the phone. And so you can sense and you can you know, know these different kinds of situations that cause anxiety. You know, uh, there was a survey that was conducted where people can name, uh, well, people were asked to specify instances that caused their biggest anxiety. And all kinds of uh, situations came up and I think we can relate to some of them. Somebody said, not knowing where the bathroom is, that causes a lot of anxiety. If I'm going out and, do a, you know, and if I'm in a public place and if I don't know where the restroom is, it makes me anxious. Uh, being late to a place that causes anxiety. Sudden changes in plans or routines. I don't know if you have friends like that. If there is a sudden change to the plan or if there's a sudden change to the routine, there is anxiety because there's a sudden shift and now we have to do things differently and that causes anxiety for some. Some have said, when the doorbell rings and you're not expecting anyone, that causes anxiety. When you're home, you're alone, doorbell rings, or you're with someone, the doorbell rings and you're not expecting anyone. Who is that? Talking to people, as simple as that, causes anxiety. Conflict with people causes anxiety. Some have said, making a phone call to a new person, to a new person you've not spoken before, that also causes anxiety. See, we've all struggled with anxiety as an emotion that overwhelms us and overpowers us. And situational anxiety is different for each one of us. It differs from person to person. And one situation that causes anxiety for you doesn't cause the same for another person. But ultimately, we know that God has told us how to handle anxiety. And I want to just give you a few pointers from God's word on handling anxiety. Just a few pointers and then we close. So the first thing I would say is, when you're anxious, leave the outcome in God's hands. 
leave the outcome in god's hands one of my favorite verses my go to verses which i've quoted many times uh, in solid ground proverbs chapter 21 verse 31 proverbs chapter 21 verse 31 it says the horse is prepared for the day of battle but the victory belongs to the lord the horse is prepared for the day of battle but the victory belongs to the lord there are three parts to this verse which we have to understand the first part is the battle it says there is a battle that has to be fought and this battle is a threatening situation and anything that is threatening induces anxiety in us that's the first part there is a battle the second part is the work there is work that has to be done and that is preparing the horse for the battle and who prepares the horse the people they prepare the horse they cannot be idle they have to get the horse ready for the battle but then comes the third part of the verse which is the outcome third part is the outcome and the outcome is prepared by god it is not prepared by man the outcome is victory given by god and so when we look at our situations we should have the same frame of mind to say that there is a threatening situation i know i'm facing a threat but i'm going to take the steps which are necessary i'm going to take the steps which i have to do i'm going to do the preparations which the situation calls me to do but i'm going to leave the outcome in god's hands because victory belongs to god outcome is completely in god's hands and so to have that frame of mind brings rest it brings relief to our anxious hearts to leave the outcome in god's hands because when you face a threatening situation it could be a, 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 a it, it doesn't have to be a very serious situation you know like a crisis but when you find yourself in a threatening situation it's like the battle so what can you do well just like the horse that is you know prepared you do the work whatever you can do you do wherever you can go you do uh, you do whatever uh, you know whoever you need to meet and talk to you do that but ultimately leave the outcome in god's hands trust god for the outcome and 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 uh, the bible tells us that if you are a child of god god only gives you the best outcomes for you the best outcomes if you surrender to god he always promises the best outcomes it might not be outcomes that uh, that that we desired at times but it will be the best outcome in the final analysis it will be the best outcome um ultimately in the ultimate sense you know the world's number one fear they say is the fear of public speaking and uh, second to that it's been said that the uh, the second greatest fear is the fear of death so fear of public speaking was apparently placed above you know the uh, fear of death and um, there was a comedian who you know who uh, who made a comment on that because you know he often gets on stage and he does stand up comedy and and he made a comment on this uh, this finding and he said it's it's really strange that you know fear of public speaking is above the fear of death he said uh, if that's true it means that if i'm at a funeral i would rather be in the in the casket than to be the person doing the eulogy and i think he made a very interesting observation that there is more anxiety and fear in the act of public speaking than the fear of death i don't know how it's true i can't wrap my mind uh, around that but but i can tell you from my own experience that public speaking is something that is uh, you know um, Uh, anxiety inducing it is an uh, anxious you know uh, work which you you know which which i am to do um and uh, facing uh, you know the fear of um, public speaking is something that you can only get used to and you can you can outgrow and by the grace of god and that alone uh, somehow you know i'm able to speak without allowing anxiety to cripple me to paralyze me because like i said it's not possible to eliminate anxiety completely don't have that expectation but have the right expectation of having less anxiety anxiety that's not crippling anxiety that's not paralyzing but the kind of anxiety that can boost you in what you have to do that will give you a boost so that is uh, you know what we learn from god's word concerning anxiety uh, i i heard the story of a preacher who gave a very powerful you know sermon but he was anxious uh, it was his you know first time preaching and he was very anxious and uh, because of that anxiety in the end uh, he made a blooper you know he said uh, without god's help moses couldn't have built the ark without god's help moses couldn't have built the ark people were convicted but they were also confused 
because because anxiety can actually cause you to you know say things forget things uh, misspeak uh, miscommunicate so so uh, those are some of the things that you know you might uh, imagine if you have to get on stage and if you have to speak or if you have to sing or if you have to exhort uh, or even if you have to come forward and you know share a testimony it makes you anxious right because you imagine uh, misspeaking or missing details or 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 you just imagine stuttering or uh, or not saying the right things the right way all kinds of imaginations that flood our minds but what god tells us is that if we trust him if we do the preparations necessary and if we leave the outcome in god's hands we can find relief for our anxiety and so that's why i i follow this proverb for anxious situations so make that your prayer to say god i feel anxious because of the situation but i will do the best i can i will do the best i can but i'm going to trust you for the outcome the second point i would say is outgrow the fear of man outgrow the fear of man one of the most common anxieties is uh, social anxiety and one of the primary causes of social anxiety if you get to the bottom of it really is the fear of man it is the fear of man it is being overly concerned about what others might think uh, fearful overly about their opinions judgments or their social evaluation of you and and being caught in a cycle of anxiety because of that and uh, i'm not saying this is the only cause of social anxiety but this is a major cause but what does the bible say psalm 118 verse 6 it says the lord is with me i will not be afraid what can mere mortals do to me what can man do to me the lord is with me i will not be afraid what can man do to me i would encourage anyone who has social anxiety to take this verse to heart and say the lord is with me i will not be afraid what can a mere person do to me and uh, you know i've heard i've heard uh, testimonies of people who have who have taken this this verse to their heart they have stood on this verse and that has helped them cope with social anxiety uh, it 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 um, doesn't mean that in one day you know you come out of social anxiety but you learn to outgrow the fear of man that you you learn to um, reduce more and more the fear of a man if you are intentional about it and if you take god's help say god i don't want to fear man anymore i don't want to fear what man can do to me because what can man do to me you are god and you are with me and you are before me and you are in sovereign control of every person and all their actions what can man do to me let that be a frame of mind let that be what we meditate in our minds in social anxiety so we learn to outgrow that The next point i want to give is concerning the feeling of anxiety you see i i've i've just been talking about situations outcomes and all that but what do you do about the feeling of anxiety because when when anxiety strikes you the immediate problem is the unpleasant feeling that you have in the chest right the uh, the unpleasant bad feeling weight that you feel on the chest what do we do about that just i just want to give you one point and that has helped me you know when i have faced those situations apart from you know breathing exercises and drinking water and and all that which you already know and which you already uh, practice but aside from that and and i think they do have certain uh, they do have merits to them they are valid things to do that will help us relieve the feeling but but what do you do other than that when your heart is beating fast you know you you feel uneasy in your chest your head is aching your palms are sweating uh maybe your your uh, mouth is dry what do you do when you feel anxious in that moment cling to god in prayer cling to god i chose that word very specifically cling to god in prayer cling to god in prayer because in the moment of anxiety when you have the unpleasant feeling the only thing the only comfort that you can receive is god and you have to reach out to god and and you have to cling to god in prayer you have to take hold of god's hand you have to hold him tightly you have to cling to him and you do that through prayer you do that through your your communication with god as you are waiting for the outcome which is in god's hands you have to cling to god in prayer to be in constant prayer and you do that by telling him what's bothering you you do that by telling him what's troubling you by telling him everything that is on your heart that's on your mind and you stay in that state of prayer you stay in the state of clinging to god in constant communication with god you know there's a tragic story that happened in tamil nadu 
three young boys who came from, you know, uh, a, a village, you know, to a city. They moved uh, looking for a job that they wanted to find for themselves. But, uh, you know, um, circumstances, you know, um, led them to uh, unfavorable, you know, places. And ultimately, you know, the police ended up framing them for a crime which they did not commit. They, they just happened to find themselves in a, in, a, in a bad situation accidentally. And the police who were dealing with a you know, case of crime decided to frame them, to frame these three boys for a crime that they did not commit. This is a true story. And uh, the police ended up chasing them. And uh, eventually, the police caught them. And uh, eventually, they, they um, lost their lives. But there was one person, there was one person who, uh, who, uh, who survived to tell the story. And I think this happened uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, and this one person who survived, you know, one of the boys, um, he lived to, uh, to tell the tale. And uh, I can't imagine the level of anxiety that, that they would have gone through. You know, to be in a situation where you're being hunted by the police, by people who are powerful, for a crime which you did not commit, for something that you haven't done. They were hunted, they were chased, and they were caught, and, they were, uh, and, and their lives were lost. But when we think of that story, I, you know, I think it should remind us of the story of David in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Because David actually went through the same circumstance. Because he was hunted. You know, he was being chased by King Saul. He was innocent. But he was framed guilty by Saul. No grounds. And he was being chased. And he was, he was, uh, he was running for his life. And he ran from place to place. And I can't imagine the level of anxiety that he was living with every day. You know? Of course, he might have known that, you know, as, as, as a person after God's own heart, I'm sure he would have known. I'm sure he would have known that God is sovereign and God is good and God is in, the con is in control of the outcomes. He knows all of that. And we see that in many Psalms, don't we? He describes God. But at the same time, David also had to deal with the unpleasant uh, weight on the chest that comes because of anxiety. He also had to deal with the, with the uh, unpleasant you know, feeling of anxiety, even though he knows the outcome is in God's hand. So how did he deal with that? Psalm 63 verse 8, David says, God, I cling to you. I cling to you. And he said, your strong right hand holds me securely. He said, I cling to you, God. I cling to you. That's what David did. He was clinging to God. And he wrote songs of praise, songs of worship, songs of hope, songs that have given strength to millions and millions of Christians. And God allowed that, that anxiety in his life for a greater purpose, for a greater plan. And we learn from David's story that by clinging to God, we can face anxiety. And he earned the title of a man after God's own heart. You know, if you're a person who is more anxious than the average person who has more anxiety than, than others. Uh, I just want you to know, God's heart completely understands your situation. God's heart is completely, uh, you know, towards you. And, and what I would say is that if you're a person who struggles with anxiety than the average person, I think you get to know God's heart more intimately than others. I think so. I think you get to know God more intimately, more deeply than others. Why? Because of your anxiety, you cling to God harder. You seek God deeper. You reach out to God. You hold God's hand more tightly than others would do. And you get to know God more deeply. And David got to know God more deeply. David got to know God's heart more deeply. And he got to know God's comfort more intimately than many others. That's how you get to know God more. I think it would be very easy for God to, you know, get rid of anxiety from our lives. But through our anxiety, we know God more. We know God more deeply. And we get to know his presence more intimately. We get to know his comfort more deeply. And so we need to remember that God is always by our side, even in times of anxiety. And all he wants us to do is cling to God, cling to him, who is stronger than our anxiety. So let's take that to heart. The next point I would say is focus on the authority of Christ. Focus on the authority of Christ. Now, anxiety, you know, makes your mind uh, focus on how helpless you are. And it makes your mind focus on 
how less of a control you have on the situation. And that makes your anxiety bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because you just realize you, you, you can't do anything, right? You've said that many times. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing more I can do. What more can I do? And the anxiety gets bigger and bigger. And so we should avoid the pitfall of overthinking. And a lot of overthinking causes anxiety. So instead of overthinking, we have to focus our minds on the authority of Christ. Focus our minds on the authority of Christ. Because Christ said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has all the authority. And that means nothing can happen to you without his permission. Nothing can happen to you without his permission because he has all the authority. And as a child of God, you belong to him. And ultimately, you are not in charge of your life. And the good news is you don't have to be. Jesus is supreme. And let Jesus be in charge of your life and trust his authority over your life. And so we need to think about our circumstances at every turning point, every event, every step of the way, that God is always in full control and he will always be in control. And we entrust ourselves in God's care. And life is more anxious when your life is more about you and less about Christ. There's more anxiety when the focus is more on self and less on Christ. And so the most liberating thing we can do is to make Christ the end goal, to make him your purpose, to make him the joy of your life so that the temporary valueless things of the world don't make us, uh, don't, they don't bog us down. By being centered on him, we have less anxiety. The next point I want to say is that when we are struck with anxiety, God wants us to pray the armor of God. God wants us to pray the armor of God. I remember speaking, you know, with a person who was struggling with anxiety and uh, couldn't explain it. And the person, uh, you know, was not able to bond with God, was not, was not able to connect with God. And uh, in spite of having the, you know, real intention to pray and to, and to commune with God, but there seems to be a barrier. There, there, there seems to be a wall between God and the person. And, and, and there is also anxiety coming along with it. And so there is a separation that comes. And so I remember speaking to a person who was, who was experiencing that. And, and, uh, and I said, I want to pray about this. And I, and I prayed and then I said, I think God wants you to pray the armor of God. God wants you to pray the armor of God. And if you want to know what is that, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 17. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can stand your ground. And you can read that passage to, to see what the armor of, uh, of, of God is. But what I've uh, understood is that as Christians, we can be attacked with anxiety from a spiritual source, as I've said before. There can be, you know, uh, an, an attack or a barrier that seems to come from the enemy, you know, fr fr from the uh, demonic source. And what God has told us is to pray the armor of God, to put on the armor of God. Because it says, on the day of evil, on the day of evil. And, and I think on the day of evil is speaking about, you know, a, a day or a time in your life when you know that the attack is from the enemy. So on the day of evil, in the time of evil, when you're being attacked, God says, put on the full armor of God. But what is this armor of God? You know, we don't, we don't like physically have the armor of God to put it on ourselves. What is this armor of God? You know, it's, it's not to just wake up and, and say, okay, you know, I, I put on my helmet, I put on my breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth, gospel of shoes, I've, I've put this on and, I've, and I'm going to go out. That's not what it means. It's centered on prayer. It is praying the armor of God. It is praying the word of God, praying the scriptures, praying these verses, uh, you know, over your life, over yourself. As you pray about these things, there is a shift that takes place. And I, and I remember checking with this person, you know, was there, was there any change? And the person told me about a shift that, that takes place. And, and as you pray the word of God, as you pray these verses and say, God, I put this on. God, I, I pray for the belt of truth. I pray for the, uh, uh, for the helmet of salvation to guard my mind. As you pray the armor of God, there is a shift that takes place. It's a very real experience. I've experienced it myself. There is a shift that takes place. And it feels like you are shifted 
from, uh, you know, from, uh, from fear into a state of freedom. And, and it's a shift that takes place that you sense in the spirit and you can sense it very clearly. And so that shift takes place only when we pray the word of God. Praying the word of God is, is more powerful. You know, why do you think Jesus quoted the written word of God when he was being tempted by the devil? Because Jesus is showing us that there is power in God's word. There is power in the written word of God. And that's why we call this the sword of the spirit. So God has given us his word also as a weapon. Not just for our understanding, but also as a weapon. When we stand on God's word and when we confess God's word in prayer. So we need to learn to pray the armor of, of God at times. The next point I would say is exercise thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, the very first verse that we read, it says, don't be anxious about anything, pray about everything. But then it says, make your uh, requests to God with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. It's a small detail, but I think it, it's a very powerful and practical antidote to anxiety. God's word says, uh, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, belong to Christ Jesus. I think thanksgiving is a practical and, and, and a powerful, you know, uh, a relief for anxiety. You know, to, to just make a list of the things that you're grateful for in your life. To just make a list of, you know, uh, uh, things or, or the people in your life or, or the blessings in your life. To, to count your blessings and to go them one by one and say, God, I thank you for this. You won't realize how many blessings you have in your life. And, and you won't realize until then how many things you ought to be grateful to God for. And that brings instant relief to anxiety. It's very practical. Immediate relief to anxiety in certain times. I remember the story of Matthew Henry. I always mention the story when it comes to Thanksgiving. It never grows old. You probably heard it many times, but I love to say this because there's always somebody who hasn't heard the story. Matthew Henry, you know, the person who uh, wrote a very famous commentary on the Bible, uh, a man who knew God, he went through a circumstance when he was robbed uh, of his wallet by a thief. And then he read this verse that says, be thankful in all circumstances. Be thankful in, in all circumstances. And he thought to himself, how do I thank God in this situation? Somebody just robbed my wallet. How do I thank him? And then he thought for a moment and he said, okay, God, I'll be thankful to you. I'm, I'm giving you thanks because he never robbed me before. This is the first time he's robbing me. So I thank you for that. And he said, God, I thank you that he only took my wallet and not my life. Thank you for that. The third thing is that he took all the money I had in the wallet, but it wasn't much. So I thank you for that. It was very little money. The fourth thing he said was, God, I thank you that I was the one who was robbed and not the one who robbed. Thank you that I was the robbed and not the robber. And so he found a way to thank God even in a circumstance like this. And Think about the, the, the pleasant feeling or, or, or the joy that he would have been able to experience even in that circumstance through thanksgiving because he found a way to thank God even in a circumstance like that. And we must learn to do the same, to give thanks to God in all circumstances. So let me leave you with a promise, a promise from God concerning anxiety. I, I close with this. God has promised a protection for your mind and your heart. A protection for your mind and your heart. And what is that protection? It is the peace of God. It's the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. I read again. It says, don't be anxious in everything. Pray. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need to pray saying, God, I receive your peace for my mind and for my heart. I pray that your peace will protect my mind and protect my, my heart. So God encourages us to deal with anxiety, to deal with, uh, with fear by taking his help, by standing on God's word. As we sang this morning, I want to close with these words that we sang this morning and then we're going to pray. We sang this morning, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer.
That's what this verse is telling us. Carry everything to God in prayer with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray.